Independence Day is coming, and Tree Day is coming, and Hug a Panda Day is coming. <laughs> well, listen, listen, man, we're not preaching on holidays. We're preaching the Word of God. But it just so happened the way it rolled around, and God laughing at me that you're going to preach this today on Father's Day. So... <laughs> yeah, it's great. It's great. Nothing like humility to start off the day. But nobody on the face of this earth enjoys what you and I enjoy if you're in Christ today. You get to call the God of the universe, the creator of all things, the one who slung the stars perfectly by the breath of his mouth, the one who formed and craft every galaxy, crafted everything that's out there by the word of his power and keeps by the word, the word of his power, you get to call him Father. Mm -hmm through the blood of Jesus Christ. Now, I don't know what kind of earthly father you had, if you had a good father or you had a bad father. I have no idea. But I'm telling you, if you're in Christ, you've got the best father you could ever have. He'll never cheat you. He'll never rob from you. He'll never lie to you. He'll never steal from you. He'll never do you wrong. He's the greatest father you could ever have. And I get that benefit, and you get that benefit, just by just what you read in John chapter 1, verse 12. Those folks rejected him and didn't receive him, but as many as received him to them, give you power to become the sons of God. And then you read over in Romans chapter 8, I get to cry, Abba, Father, to the God of the universe. I don't know if that moves you at all. That moves me. You get to call the one that has done everything exceedingly well and perfect, He's sinless, perfect, and holy. You get to go right to the throne room. Don't take a waiting pass. Don't take a, don't take a deli ticket. You get to go right to the throne room of the one who made everything and say, Hi, Father. Yeah. Does, that even, uh, does that even move you at all that you get to call the one who died for you Father? Mm -hmm. What a great thing that is. What a blessing that is to you and I today that we would have the ability to communicate with someone who has our best interest at heart. I'm going to show you something today. There, there, there's some stuff in your Bible that's so cool about our Heavenly Father, and it's primarily found in one book. It's an Old Testament book called Proverbs. Now, I need to set this up for you. Go to Proverbs chapter 1. I need to set this up for you a little bit. Your Bible has three applications of Scripture. Go to Proverbs chapter 1, please. Your Bible has, in your script, the Scriptures in your Holy King James Bible have three applications, historical, doctrinal, and practical. Number one most important thing is doctrine. It matters what this book teaches on any subject on the face of this earth. Marriage, where to get your job, baptisms, resurrections, whatever you want to go through and learn, God's book is the book to go to for doctrine. I'm saying that for this reason, folks, this morning as we, as we lay some foundation work here, is that doctrinally, God is talking to Israel. Israel is God's son from Exodus 4.22. He's the son he called out of Egypt from the bondage of Pharaoh and said, that's my firstborn, that's my son. We say that's Jesus Christ. Well, that's what we went through in Sunday school. There's many sons or son of God in the Bible. There's the Lord Jesus Christ. There is the nation of Israel. There's the angelic beings that fell. There's Adam. And then there's us today. And outside of the Lord Jesus Christ, the son of God, and you, folks, those, they didn't have the same relationship you and I have that we have with our father. And God's going to deal with the nation of Israel through this book called Proverbs. But historically, it's a man named Solomon talking to his son, Rehoboam. Mm -hmm. Folks, I don't know if you read much of your Bible through in the Old Testament. You ought to read it. It's a great, it's a great masterpiece theater of which the New Testament flicks the light switch on so you can behold all those wonderful paintings and all those drawings and all those statues. And in the Old Testament, Rehoboam was a fool. He should have listened to the young men when it's time for him to take the throne. Rehoboam should have listened to the old men who had the wisdom and who had seen what Solomon did. But you know what Rehoboam did? He, do, he does what you and I do. We listen to our peers. We listen to those that agree with us. You know, the young guys, the cool guys, the hipsters. Don't go to the old people. I mean, what do they know? They're old. No, you can gain some wisdom and some understanding from some old people if they've lived their life right for the Lord. But Rehoboam's a fool. So historically, it's Solomon talking to Rehoboam. But I want to make some practical application for you and I this morning as a son of God, as a child of God today. And there's no better and more pointed place to go than the book of Proverbs. Look with me in chapter 1. We're going to run some Bible this morning, as we are wont to do. Uh, how many verses you got? Well, that's not the right question to ask this morning. <laughs> I did say an hour or so. Yeah, it's over an hour or so, but that's right. Kenny always prays an hour or so to cover himself. The Bible says this in the book of Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 1, verse 1. The Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, 
king of Israel, to know wisdom and instruction, to perceive the words of understanding, to receive the instruction of wisdom, justice, and judgment, and equity, to give subtlety to the simple, to the young man knowledge and discretion, to, a wise man will hear and will increase learning, and a man of understanding shall attain unto wise counsels, to understand a proverb and the interpretation, the words of the wise and their dark sayings, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. Now look at what happens. What's verse 8 say? My son. This morning, I want you, as we go through this message, I want you not to look around this room. I don't want you to think about anybody. I want you to sit here and let the Spirit of God deal with you as if God is saying, my son. And he's talking to you directly. Don't think about anybody else that should be who is not here or whatever. Don't think about it. I want you to think about your Heavenly Father talking to you directly when he says, my son. What happens with my female? You have a male living inside you that's the same as the Holy Ghost. Mm -hmm. He's talking to you directly today. He's a practical application. And the first thing he says is, the fear of the Lord is being in wisdom. He kicks it right off the bat and says, you know what? You ought to fear me. Our fear of the Lord is being in knowledge. Excuse me. He says right off the bat, you ought to fear me. You ought to fear your dad. You ought to hear, fear your Heavenly Father, not in this weird, I'm walking around and I, I, I just I can't do anything because I'm afraid that if I step on an ant, he's going to wipe me out. No, it's a reverential, holy fear that he's the king and I'm not. If it wasn't for his grace, mercy, and kindness, I'd be in hell, deservedly so. Yes, but he interjected that grace, mercy, and kindness and saved my soul. It starts off with, my son, hear what I'm about to say. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Now let's get into it. The Bible says this in verse number 10. My son, if sinners entice thee, consent thou not. If they say, come with us, let us lay wait for blood. Let us lurk privily for the innocent without cause. Let us swallow them up alive as the grave and whole as those that go down into the pit. We shall find all precious substance. We shall fill our houses with spoil. Cast in thy lot among us. Let us all have one purse. My son, walk not down the way with them refrain thy foot from their path for their feet run to evil and make haste to shed blood surely in vain the net is spread is spread in the sight of any bird and they lay wait for their own blood and they lurk privily for their own lives so are the ways of everyone that is greedy of gain which take away the life of the owners thereof go over to chapter 23 please go over to chapter 23 please the first admonition directly to you and I today on Father's Day is this. Don't walk with sinners and get attached to what they do. You're going to be lured. You're going to be pulled in. The Bible word is enticed to walk with them. And he said, my son, don't you walk with them. He didn't say remove yourself and become sterile and never talk to anybody about the Lord. He didn't say walk around with a halo on your head and some weird rough garment where you're so odd that nobody wants to talk to you. He's saying what they do, what they say, their philosophy, the way they believe, and what they promote, don't walk with them. Can two walk together except to be agreed? I'm not in agreement with what this world has to say. They're in darkness, I'm in light in the Lord. Are you better than them? In Christ I am. And so aren't you. You start to start acting like it. This sinner saved by grace stuff has gotten blown out of proportion where we just want to say, I'm just a sinner all the time. And while, you know, Lord, I just got to commit some sin today. You know, a dog has fleas and everything. Find that in the New Testament for me where you have to commit a sin. Show it to me. You can't find it because it's not in there. And his admonition right off the bat is, you're going to live around them. You're going to live next to them. You're going to work with them. But don't pick up their habits. Don't talk like they talk. Don't be like they're at. Don't watch their shows. Don't get into gay pride. Don't hang around the sodomites. Don't do anything. Amen. You walk with me. Amen. My son, he's talking directly to you. What? Not my wife. Not my kids. He's talking to me. Son, don't you walk with them. Well, Lord, I live down here. Stop making excuses. My son did it for 33 and one half years and didn't get tangled one time with him. In fact, he said, which of you convinced of me of sin? You couldn't get Jesus to sin if you tried. Mm -hmm. But he hangs around publicans and heartless all day long. Yeah. And he doesn't fall into sin. I fell into sin. No, you didn't. You wanted to. But it starts with getting lured to walk with him. I wonder, and you know what happens? You get away from this book. Mm -hmm. And you start getting pulled in and pulled in and like, oh, that's really not a bad movement. And well, No, we're here for the salvation of men's souls and to get saints edified for their judgment seat of Christ appointment. That's our mission. How that all works out and happens is God work with you individually. But you can't let sinners entice you. Go to 23. I'll show you another passage that has to do with this. Look at 23, verse 15. <coughs> 23, 
23, verse 15 with me. My son, if thine heart be wise, my heart shall rejoice, even mine. Yeah, you want to make God happy? You want to make his heart rejoice? My son, if thine heart be wise, my heart shall rejoice, even mine. Yea, my reign shall rejoice when thy lips speak right things. Let not thine heart envy sinners, but be thou the fear of the Lord all day long. For surely there is an end, and thy expectation shall not be cut off. Hear thou, my son, and be wise and guide thine heart in the way. Be not among wine-bibbers, among riotous eaters of flesh. For the drunkard and the glutton shall come to poverty, and drunkenness shall clothe the man with rags. Hearken unto thy father that begat thee, and despise not thy mother when she is old. That would be the new Jerusalem, Galatians 4.26. Buy the truth and sell it not. Also wisdom and instruction and understanding. The father of the righteous shall greatly rejoice, and he that begat the wise child shall have joy of him. Thy father and thy mother shall be glad, and she that bear thee shall rejoice. He, my father's talking to me. and says right there, don't be among riotous wine bibbers and eaters of flesh. Do I have to go to the store? Yes, I do. Do I have to watch and do everything they do? No, I don't. Do I have to talk like they talk? No, I don't. Well, they're forcing it on me. Take a stand for Jesus Christ for once in your life. Stand up for your Savior and say, I'm not doing that. It might cost me my job. You know what? So what? If God got you that job to start with, which I hope that's what you believe, you didn't get that because you have a degree on the wall. If God got you that job to start, don't you think he can get you another job? Come on now, my son, don't let them entice you, don't let them lure you, don't let them pull you in because they're going to try to. Folks, if you're saved, you're eternally secure. There's no doubt about it. But you know what the battle now is? The battle over the mind and the heart that's going to control where my feet go. It's going to control what my eyes look at. And I'm going to get pulled on from every avenue. And my father says, don't even let them get in on you. Don't let them even pull you that way. I'm giving you some advice, son, from the Word of God as your heavenly Father. Do not let them seduce you to go against me. Amen. You will be among sinners. You will be among the lost. Don't adopt their ways. Right. You belong to Jesus Christ. He bought you with a price. Mm -hmm. You think, well, that's pretty serious, man. You're talking, yeah, man, this stuff gets me angry because of the sin in my own life and how I do my dad wrong. Doesn't it bother you at all that you're against, that you get pulled in, lured in before you know it? You're walking with them. You're like, F folks, Lot didn't start out in the gate of Sodom. It was a slow trickle down where somebody in that city, starting with his eyes, and then he moves in, and then he's got a, he's facing Sodom, and then he's got a house right in the downtown. And then he says, take my daughters. How do you think that started? Enticement. Seduction. Just, just a little pull. Come on over. You know, sin's more fun than sanctification. Mm -hmm. Not according to the Word of God, it's not. Because mm -hmm. I see the end from that pleasure of sin. That thing's going to enter in bitterness and anger and hatred. And I'm going to despise what I just did against my father. And the Lord said, well, you just stay clean, man. But it all starts with that enticement, getting pulled away. My son, if sinners entice thee, which they will, don't consent with them. Don't, don't we love Pro uh, Psalm chapter 1? Blessed is the man. But we don't do anything that it says. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. They're going to be around you. But blessed is the man that doesn't start walking with them. That means you get joined up with them, and you agree with what they're doing and saying. Folks, this world hates Jesus Christ. It hates God, and it hates that Bible, and it hates you. Just come out on the street for a little bit and find out what they really think about you and Jesus Christ. I'm serious. It's a, if you just do it once, just to get an eye opener of what they really think about your Savior. I thought everybody loves the Lord. Saved folks barely love the Lord. Number two, chapter two, verse, uh, chapter, Proverbs chapter two. We're going to spend some time in Proverbs. We're not going to go all over the place. Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. All that stuff. A ton of Bible verses on us, but I want to stick the book of Proverbs, Lord willing, this morning. There's enough right in this book. So number one, watch your walk. Watch your walk, son. Number two, he's got your best interest at heart. You know, you know how hard that is for a, a, a particular American who believes that, you know what, if it can't get done, I'll just pull up my bootstraps. 
You know, that's the World War II generation. And thank God for it. I'm glad, I'm glad that we, we, we come from the baby boomers and all that stuff. I'm glad for that, that some folks have some initiative and some gumption. But try to talk to some of those, old, I mean, those older folks about Jesus Christ. And they'll just tell you, I'll do it on my own. I don't need that. Because they've been doing it for decades on their own. And as a child of God now, I got saved by grace through faith. But I, it's like I don't want the Lord to bless me anymore. He has my best interest at heart. It's weird we trust him for salvation, but we don't trust him for the every minute, every day, every hour of our life. He really does have my best interest at heart. Well, he's just up there looking to whip me. That's a perverse God you're serving. He's a loving, kind father that's holy. But he has our best interest at heart. Even when things don't go your way, he knows what's best for you and I. Look at Proverbs 7. But that takes some faith. That takes some belief that the book is true and the God that saved me is a great father. Look at chapter 2, verse 1. My son, if thou wilt receive my words and hide my commandments with thee, so that thou incline thy ear to wisdom and apply thine heart to understand. Yea, if thou criest after knowledge and liftest up thy voice to understand. So we have to, there has to be some shoe leather to it. If thou seekest her as silver and search for her as for hid treasures, then thou shalt understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. For the Lord giveth wisdom. Out of his mouth cometh knowledge and understanding. He layeth up sound wisdom for the righteous. He is a buckler to them that walk uprightly. He keepeth the paths of judgment and preserveth the way of his saints. Then shalt thou understand righteousness and judgment and equity, yea, every good path. I don't know if you've studied ancient battle, but you know what a, buck, you know what a buckler is? <laughs> he says he'll preserve. I mean, it's armament. That's what God does for you. You give yourself to him as his son, and he says, I'll take care of you. In fact, I'll preserve your way. I have your best interest at heart, even when you think things are going bad. Go with me. Chapter 3, verse number 1. Chapter 3, verse 1. My son. Forget not my law, but let thine heart keep my commandments. For a length of days and long life and peace shall they add to thee. You want to live, you want to live a long life? Do what he says. But it starts with my son. You've got, you got to give it to me. I have your best interest in heart. Whether you live 50, 60, 70 years, I am looking out for you. Look what the Bible says over in chapter, number, uh, chapter 3, verse 21. Chapter 3, verse 20, My son, let not them depart from thy eyes, but keep sound wisdom and discretion. So shall there be life unto thy soul and grace to thy neck. Then shalt thou walk in thy way safely, and thy foot shall not stumble. When thou liest down, thou shalt not be afraid. Yea, thou shalt lie down in thy sleep. He even takes care of my sleep. And thy sleep shall be sweet. Be not afraid of sudden fear, neither of the desolation of the wicked when it cometh. For the Lord shall be thy confidence, and shall keep thy foot from being taken. You want a sure walk with the Lord? You want to make sure your steps are sure you're going the right way? Trust your Heavenly Father to do it. Now you're going to say, well, what you, don't you have any other Bible? Remember when Joseph, we've been going through it on Wednesday nights for what seems like a long time? <laughs> but you go through the life of Joseph. What does Joseph say at the end of his life in Genesis 50, verse 20? What you meant for evil, God meant for good. Thrown in a pit? Sold? You, you, you faked my death? You sent me into Egypt? Well, what you meant for evil, God meant for good. If you trust your Heavenly Father, He knows what's best for you. Mm -hmm. Well, Lord, I think this job's the best for me. Well, why don't you pray a little bit longer and I'll give you the right job? Yeah, but you know what? No, son, do you believe me? Of course, you saved my soul. Well, do you believe me in the everyday life? I say I do because I'm in church, but realistically, I don't. Do you have to put some shoe leather to it? Yeah, He told you that in chapter 2. Should you have a good resume, maybe, in a practical sense? Sure you do. But you need to trust the Lord to put you in the right spot for his honor and glory because he has your best interest at heart. When I got out of pro baseball in 1989, I had four years of college. I never finished. Uh, I was nine credits short of, of my degree. I uh, went and played pro baseball for a little while, very short time. Most people have a cup of coffee. The majors, I had coffee bean in the minors. <laughs> I mean, Starbucks sort of rejected it big time. But, I mean... Uh, a very short career, then we got out, and then we got married. Best day of my life, honey. Best day of my life. Yeah. <laughs> it's Father's Day. It's about me. No. <laughs> I mean, worship holidays, but I'm just saying that. Anyway. But I mean, then we got married. I mean, I, you know what? I want, to find my, I want to find my career path. No, I still hear Frank Brown's, uh, my earthly dad, 
go get a job. <laughs> that thing has resonated for 50 years, man, plus. You know what? You, don't, you know what? Lord, I've got, a, I've got a college education. I played professional baseball. Surely there's something, maybe a manager, maybe a VP position, making 150 a year. No, go work at Sullivan Paper and go spend all your time working there four hours a day overtime, work at five to five, and then go pump gas from six to 11, right from there up to the food bank in West Springfield. You did that? Yep, did it for several years. Did you ask the Lord about it? I did. How come the Lord didn't give you a good job with college education and prayer? Because that's where the Lord wanted me, because he has my best interests at heart. But school loans and all that stuff, yeah, somehow the Lord managed all that stuff out, didn't he? Ask the Lord about your career path. Ask the Lord about your job. Ask the Lord about where you're supposed to go in your life. He's your heavenly father. He has your best interest at heart. Not that you're going to have a million dollars in your bank account and four or five. No, he's going to make your life to be like Jesus Christ for the honor and glory of him so that you'll have a good appearance at the judgment seat of Christ. But you've got to trust him. That's part of him talking to you as a son today, directly to you one-on-one. -on -one. Well, I don't know what job to get. Brother Steve texted me. He has an opportunity. I had an opportunity at three different job interviews. Well, gee, I, I, why, don't I just, why don't you ask the Lord which one to take? Mm -hmm. So you can be maybe a good witness and a testimony at that job for him. Well, I need to make a lot of money. How about somebody there who's lost and going to hell and needs to hear about Jesus Christ? Right. See, when you don't think heavenly minded, you get upset with the Lord, you get upset with your father, and you think your father's doing you wrong, and he's staring you wrong. No, he knows what's going on, and he cares for you, and he cares for me. It's hard because we're so pulp the boots and, Lord, thanks for saving me, but I got it from here. That's what the book of Galatians is about. Oh, you got saved by grace through faith, but now you're justified by the works of the law? Really? No, I've got you covered all the way through. In fact, I've got your prayer life covered. When you don't know what to pray, the Holy Spirit makes intercession for you. <laughs> when you can't trust yourself to keep your salvation, he keeps it for you. When you don't keep his word, his word doesn't return down to him void. Right. God has got this whole thing taken care of. You don't think he has your best interest at heart? Son, he's talking to you. My, how many times have you got to go through it? My son, my son, my son. Now he's dealing, think about how crazy this is. Solomon is the king of Israel, and he's got a fool for a boy. And he's pouring out his heart through the Holy Spirit saying, Son, I don't want you to do the things that I did wrong. I don't want you to do what I did wrong. Son, listen to me. Please listen to me. I'm glad my Heavenly Father's never done anything wrong. Not ever. Never made a mistake. So how much better when he speaks to me directly and says, Son, I know the right path for you. Go with me on to chapter 3. Back, back to chapter 3 where we were. <clears throat> chapter 3 of Proverbs. To accept his correction and discipline. Anybody like getting whipped by their old man? Anybody look forward to the the switch coming down off the tree or the rod off the refrigerator or wherever you kept the, the device of torture for your children. You got to know that God, when he whips you, it's because he loves you. And when it comes, don't kick and scream against it. Look what the Bible says in 311. 3.11 of Proverbs says, My son, despise not the chastening of the Lord, neither be weary of his correction. For whom the Lord loveth, he corrected, even as a son, even as a father, the son in whom he delighted. You know why God tans your hide and tans my hide? Oh, it's because he's mad at me. It's because he loves you. You know why he interjects things in your life to correct you and I? Because of his love for you. Oh, I, I, don't, I don't like that. Listen, Hebrews 12 says, Now no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous but grievous. Who likes getting whipped? Nobody likes getting whipped. But afterwards you realize when your father talks to you and tells you, I did it because I love you and I want you to be more like my son than like you, you realize it's love behind that whipping. He does it because he cares for you. Not because he's up there waiting for you to do something wrong. He's trying to correct you because he sees something wrong in your character and in your life that you don't see. We all think we're wonderful human beings. Oh, no, not me, brother. Yeah, you do. You think you're great. That's why you sing in the shower. That's why when you, do weight, that's why when you weight lift, you buy a T-shirt that is sold at the Baby Gap so you can show up for others. 
You want to show off. You, you think, we all think we're wonderful. And God says, no, I see. That's a flaw. That's a problem. But you know what? I'm going to give you some goodness that leads to repentance. And I want you to change it. But at some point in time, God says, no, he's not listening. i got to put a plate glass window down there. Maybe a car accident. I mean, I understand time and chance happens to them all, Ecclesiastes chapter 9, but don't overlook the fact that maybe God, as your father, yes. is putting something in your life to say, wake up, son, I love you, but I'm not going to let this activity continue. If he let that go in your life and didn't correct it, you'd be a spoiled brat. Yeah. Correction helps you stay on the path to love your Savior and to love your father, and he does it out of a caring, concerning heart. And when it comes... Don't kick against it. Don't say, Lord, why are you doing this? Say, Lord, I don't like it, but I know at the end of it, you're going to make me more like Jesus Christ. And I don't like the stripes, and I don't like the whippings, I don't like the cast, I don't like the stitches, I don't like the car wreck, I don't like, the, I don't like any of it. But I know you love me, and you're worth Because you know what? It's a father talking to a son. And that's how he's addressing it. I mean, Rehoboam, haven't you seen what I've done in my life? Rehoboam, haven't you seen what I've done wrong in my kingship? I'm trying to warn you, son, because I love you. I don't want you to end up like me. Go on with me. Chapter 5. We've got to read a little bit. Chapter 5. There's a bunch of this in chapter 5. Solomon had 700 wives and 300 concubines. I, I mean, uh, there's just nothing more to be said. Yeah. I mean, honestly, that is what, well, I'd like to have a stable of women. Well, we're going to read some verses that may make you reconsider that. We're in a sex-crazed society, folks. There's porn and filth and wickedness at the flick of a switch. I'm just telling you, from personal experience, you can get involved in that stuff. It'll take you down a sewer. You will never come out until God does something in your life. And Solomon says, look out, watch out for two things, harlots and drinking. You see, that's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. They go together. Noah gets out of the ark, and what's he do? Plants a vineyard, gets drunk, and he has an inappropriate, sodomized relationship with his son. You say, well, that's, yeah, that's in there. Yes, it 100% is in there. Then you go on further, when Eve took of the fruit, which was a grape, what's the first thing those two people notice about themselves? They were naked. Before that, it wasn't a big deal. Folks, those two things go together. And you're saying, well, what's, I don't do partake in that. But let me tell you something, man. Evil and filth is two seconds away from you. And your eye gate, and I know it's mostly the men. I understand that because we have a problem with looking. We do. I hate to reveal that to the women, but we have a problem with our eyes. You have a problem with your ears. But women look at other men and go, wow, maybe oh, this guy's a real jerk, doesn't work, doesn't pay the bills, and horrible. Father's like, kids. I wonder what it would be like to be with him. So women do the same thing. Women fantasize too. Why do you think all those romance novels are out there with Fabio? And all, you can laugh. He's like this big man with long hair, big deal. But I mean, I'm just saying it. It's out there. It's a problem. And Solomon says, I have 700 wives, 300 concubines. Son, look out. Look at the Bible says in 5.1. My son, attend unto my wisdom, and bow thy ear to my understanding, that thou mayest regard discretion, that discretion to thy lips. May keep knowledge, for the lips of a strange woman drop as a honeycomb, and her mouth is smoother than oil, but her end is bitter as wormwood, sharp as a two-edged sword. Her feet go down to death. Her steps take hold on hell. Lest thou shouldest ponder the path of life, her ways are movable, that thou canst not know them. Isn't a double-minded man unstable in all his ways? A harlot's mind is movable. She don't care anything about you. Hear me now, therefore, O ye children, and depart not from the words of my mouth. Remove thy way far from her, and come not nigh the door of her house. Don't even go near it. It'll grab your heart, guys. Lest thou give thine honor unto others, and thy years unto the cruel. Lest strangers be filled with thy wealth, and thy labors be in the house of a stranger. And, they mourn, and thou mourn at the last, when thy flesh and thy body are consumed, to say, How have I hated instruction? My heart despised your proof, and have not obeyed the voice of my teacher, nor inclined mine ear to that instructed me. I was almost in all evil amidst of the congregation and assembly. Verse 20. 
And why wilt thou, my son, be ravished with a strange woman and embrace the bosom of a stranger? 6 1. My son, if thou be surety for thy friend, if thou hast stricken thy hand with a stranger, thou hast snared with. Uh, excuse me, I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself. That's, that, that's my fault. That's 100% my error. I don't want to. I don't want to go there yet. Six twenty. I'm sorry. Six twenty. My son, keep thy father's commandment. And forsake not the law of thy mother. Bind them continually upon thy heart. And tie them about thy neck. When thou goest, it shall lead thee. When thou sleepest, it shall keep thee. And when thou awakest, it shall talk with thee. For the commandment is a lamp. And the law is light. Reproof and instruction in the way of life to keep thee, to keep thee from the evil woman, from the flattery of the tongue of the strange woman. Lust not after her beauty in thine heart. Neither let her take thee with her eyelids. For by means of a whorish woman, a man is brought to a piece of bread. And the adulteress will hunt. She's on the lookout for us, guys. For the precious life. Can a man take fire in his bosom and his clothes not be burned? Chapter 23. Chapter 23. Please. Please. Chapter 23, same, same, same book. Chapter 20, there's so much of this in here. Proverbs 23, please. And he all starts out with my son. Look at verse 26, folks. My son, give me thine heart and let thine eyes observe my ways. For a whore is a deep ditch and a strange woman is a narrow pit. She also lieth in wait as for a prey that your, the, the adulteress will hunt and increaseth. Look at this, and it increaseth the transgressors among men, among men. Who hath woe, who hath sorrow, who hath contentious, who hath babbling, who hath wounds without cause, who hath redness of eyes? They that tarry long at the wine, they that go to seek mixed wine, look not thou upon the wine when it is red, when it giveth its color in the cup, when it moveth itself to the right, at the last it biteth like a serpent. Do you have something in your Bible called a serpent? And it stingeth like an adder. Thine eyes shall behold strange women, and thy heart shall utter perverse things. Yea, thou shalt be as he that lieth down in the midst of the sea, or as he that lieth upon the top of a the mast. They have stricken me, shalt thou say. And I was not sick. They have beat me, and I felt it not. When shall I wake? Oh, I'll never touch that again. I'm never doing that again. I will seek it yet again. We're not going to go to Hosea, but it says, whoredom and new wine, that's what wrecks the heart. It'll ruin your heart. Those two things go together. Well, I don't have a drinking problem. Maybe I have an eye problem with, your, with women. I don't know. But I know that the admonition is, my son, don't look at those women. You've got to be careful. Folks, women, for, I'm talking to the males now, women will hunt you down, and they'll do things to you in your marriage, and they don't care a thing about them and move on to the next one. You've got to be so careful about this stuff, because I, as I said before, how many, I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but just think about it for a minute. If you've seen something filthy or evil, and I, I don't care what it is, but you've seen it in a movie or whatever, they say, how many times when you go to pray does that thing come by your head? Even being saved 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years. And it's, you know what? Because it burns in your heart and your mind. It's that sexual sin, and it's linked with drinking, and he says, stay away from both of them. Well, I'm a casual drinker. No such thing. Nobody drinks just to have a drink. You drink to get buzzed. And when you get buzzed, you start seeing women that aren't your wife, or if you're not married, you start seeing them, and you think, oh, she looks pretty, and she's a cow. She's not an attractive woman. I was going to say something that was just not really cool, but I just let it go. I'm maturing right before your eyes. But the alcohol, and the, that goes together. And I've got, he's got a thousand women. A thousand women, he says, son, watch it. It'll be a problem with you for all of your life. I wish to God this would go away. Barry knows in that book, stay on your face in front of the Lord, have him take it away from you, but it's not going to leave you until you get home to glory. Just when you think you got it licked, you're coming home from New Britain, and there's a big, huge sign that used to have a Bible purse on it, and now it has a chick in a bikini on it. And you're not even looking, you go, and it's that second look that always takes you. Wow, that woman's, I mean, I mean, Rachel was beautiful. Rebecca was beautiful. And those guys, Isaac and Jay, they saw that they were beautiful. There's nothing, but you know what happens? Adultery in a heartbeat. I've never committed adultery. I've never stepped out of my wife. Oh, sure you have. That's a hard thing to say with your wife sitting right over there, buddy. It's a hard thing to say. Well, I've never actually been with another woman. Uh, son? Son, I'm talking to you, son. You have been. Avoid it. Don't go around it. You know the best way to do it? Don't even be near it. 
That's a hard one, man. <laughs> go with me to Lamentations 3. I want to lament after that one, but I need to really actually go to the book of Lamentations for a minute. Lamentations chapter 3. I, t I don't take this as God. I'm thinking of my father who loves me and says, son, I'm trying to warn you. Don't you, aren't you glad your father said, get out of the traffic? One minute, and I shouldn't say that. My parents, I told you last day, my parents had a different view on traffic for me than most people. But aren't you glad your father pulled you away from things that were harmful? Aren't you glad your father said, don't go there, don't go here? That's part, well, the Lord's doing that. He never lets me have any fun. No, he's warning you. And the day you eat thereof, you shall surely die. Well, I'm not going to die today. Why won't you believe what I have to say? Because you don't trust me as your father. Look at the Bible says in Lamentations 3, verse 51. Mine eye. Look at 351 of Lamentations. So it's right after the book of Jeremiah. I'm not saying that to be smart. But uh, Lamentations 351. Mine eye affecteth mine heart because of all the daughters of my city. You know what affects your heart? What you look at. She says, you know what? Man, my heart's getting affected by what I'm looking at with my eyes. And it has to do with the daughters of the city. Now, maybe he's weeping and sorrowful, but the principle is this. You know what Job said over in uh, 31 of 1? He said, I made a covenant with my eyes. I'm not going to look at that. I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes, Psalm 101, verse 3. I mean, you have to actually, you actually have to fashion yourself and make a, uh, make a promise to the Lord and say, Lord, you need to help me with this, but I, prom I don't want to look at that. And then you have to you have to turn from it right. when it comes your way. Right. Uh, I don't know. Uh, like I said, I don't get off and go on or go off when people have a TV. But man, that thing is a it's a cesspool. If you have a fast forward button or something, you need to use it because that stuff is non-stop. And what's it trying to do? Just get you to stray away from your father. I'm talking to say, folks, just get you to move away. Man, that adulteress is, that adulteress does not have your best interest in heart. She wants to ruin your life. It's a hard thing, man. And that drink, we won't even get. If I have to sit here and tell saved folks about drink with all the verses in the Bible, that's a problem. But drinking is not, not even, there's no such thing as social sipping or just have, no. Don't even go around it. Don't be around because the two are linked together. Go with me to uh, chapter 6. Proverbs chapter 6, please. Proverbs chapter 6. I look at this as a good, I like this because my father is talking to me. It's personal. He's not talking to my wife. He's not talking to my kids. He's not talking. I'm not thinking of anybody when I preach this. He's saying to me directly, son, this is what I want you to do. Son, I'm giving you instruction. Son, I love you. Son, I'm trying. That's the relationship you have with your Heavenly Father. He's not just a drive through to get saved and get out of hell. He's your father. Look what the Bible says in Proverbs chapter 6. I read it by accident getting into it. The Bible says in 6.1, my son. If thou be surety for thy friend, if thou hast stricken thy hand with a stranger, you know, like uh, James will come up and we'll, we'll shake hands, we'll do the cool guy, you know, because you know. You know the, cool guy. the cool guy shake. But when you strike hands with somebody and you tell them something, you look them in the eye, guess what? You're on the hook for what you just did. Or you strike your hands with somebody and you look at me and I say, I'll be there tonight at 5 o'clock. I'll be on the job tomorrow. You, you're take, you, you, my son, you just made a vow and a promise with your mouth. And you followed up with a handshake. Look what he goes on to say. My son, if thou be sturdy for thy friend, if thou hast stricken thy hand with a stranger, thou art snared with the words of thy mouth, or art taken with the words of thy mouth. Do this now, my son, and deliver thyself. When thou art come into the hand of thy friend, go, humble thyself, make sure thy friend, give not sleep to thine eyes, nor slumber to thine eyelids. Deliver thyself as a roe from the hand of the hunter, as a bird from the hand of the fowler. You ought to keep your word. You say something to somebody, son, you lay something down with your mouth, do it, or shut your yap. Matthew 5 says, let your yea be yea, and your nay, nay. Well, you know, I think, no, if it's no, it's no. If it's yes, it's yes. You know how much trouble you get into by vacillating and playing the middle ground, and well, you know what, I think I'll be there. No, it's either yes or no. I get in trouble for that sometimes because I'm a little pointed like that. Get off the fence. Make a call. You're either in or out. You're either in or out, man. The Lord says the same thing. Son, 
If you say something, you better do it. You say, what's the big deal about that? Aren't you supposed to have a good witness to them that are without in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 7? As a, as, a, as a preacher and as you go through that thing, as a, as, a, as a bishop, if you say something, you better do it. Because you know what? You're only as good as your word. And when you tell me something and you don't follow through, okay, maybe something happened. The car broke down. I, I get it. Or maybe you just forgot. That happens. But when that's two, three, four times down the road, there's a problem with your character. You have horrible integrity that you can't simply say, no, I just can't make it. It's the, uh, you know, I don't. No, milk toast. It's like nailing jello to the wall. You ever tried to nail jello to the wall? It doesn't work. Well, he says the same thing. Your father talking to you directly. Nobody else around. Not husbands, not wives, not kids. Your father talking to you if you're saved. Stop saying something you have no intention of doing. Because that makes you a liar. A false witness. Oh, not me, brother. Yeah, you, brother, sister. You're, you're, listen, God's only as good as his word. Imagine if God started breaking promises in his book. What kind of God would that be? But he doesn't. He sticks by what he says and he doesn't. He doesn't, eh, you know, let's warm up. Yeah, I'll do it. Oh, no, 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 I don't know. What do you want to eat today? That's one of the most frustrating things. <laughs> Karen, what would you like to eat today? <laughs> Karen, love of my life. <laughs> Wind beneath my wings. <laughs> Breath in my lungs. What do you want to eat today? <laughs> that ejector, that e that e that ejector seat. It's working. I, no, I honestly, I get, what my, I get what my wife's trying to say because I'm going to change it anyway. <laughs> I'm just going <laughs> to. But you got to say it because you got to build a little cred, even though she knows I'm lying through my teeth. <laughs> but I mean, after make a decision, man. And you know what? Stick by it. Your testimony relies on that. And when people say, oh, he's a Christian. Yeah, but he isn't. Do what he says. They may not come out and say it, but they know there's something wrong with your Christianity when you can't keep your word. And your Father in heaven says, "Son, a card laid's a card played. If you're not gonna, if you're not gonna do it, don't say it. You're better off not saying." It. Doesn't he say in Ecclesiastes five, "It's better not to vow a vow than to vow not pay it, and to don't defer to pay a vow." If you're gonna lay yourself out, do it. I'll be there. Do it. If not, praise the Lord. I can't make it. My son. Just his father talking to his son. Imagine, imagine the father in heaven on his throne sitting down, and you're sitting there like a little two-year-old, three-year-old, whatever, four-year-old, and he's talking to you from his throne and says, son, I'd like you to do this. And son, I see I have your best interest in heart. And son, I'm going to whip you sometimes because I know you're going to get out of trouble, but it's because I love you. And son, if you say something, you ought to do it. You, you don't have fathers that ever taught you that stuff? I know you had some earthly dads that were good that taught you that stuff. How much better when it comes from the king of glory? Mm -hmm. And he's doing that right now to you through the book of Proverbs. Solomon has a fool for a son, but he's not going to stop trying to help him out. Keep on going. We have a couple more. 19, chapter 19. Chapter 19 in Proverbs. Chapter 19. You know, you read through your Bible and you don't realize how many times these phrases stick out to you until the Lord says, my son, that's you. My son, that's you. And I'm like, oh, Lord, no, uh, no, that's, uh, that's somebody else, man. No, that's you. Look at 19 with me, please. Chapter 19, verse 27. He says in 1927, cease, my son, to hear the instruction that causeth the air from the words of knowledge. You need to stop listening to anything or anyone that pulls you away from this King James Bible. Mm -hmm. Stop it. Right. He didn't say give it place. He didn't say give them a couple minutes. He said when they're blatantly causing you and pulling you away from the words of instruction, the words of knowledge on, he said stop listening to them. Right. 
well, I'll just give that preacher a few more weeks. Stop listening to him. Well, you know, the Christian, they have good intentions. Stop listening to them. You say, how crazy is that? First John chapter 4 says what? Beloved, you can't believe every spirit. You've got to try the spirits. Yes. Uh, 1 Corinthians 14 says, there may be many voices in the world, and none of them is without signification. Everybody has something to say, and it may seem significant, but when it pulls you away from that book and your Heavenly Father, stop listening to it. Well, that preacher sounds so good. I'd have to say that's probably a little alarm bell. I'm not saying that they have to be rough and crass and all that stuff. I'm just saying that, you know what, when there's too much sugar, it'll give you diabetes. There's got to be a little bit of a, a, what's, what's a, a sour head mixed in between. <laughs> There's got to be a little bit of, hey, wake up, man, right. in the midst of the preaching, along with the comfort and the joy and all that stuff. And you can't have a guy that just screams at you all the time. There's got to be a good mix. And the Lord says right there, talking to you as his son, stop listening to them. Well, my mother thinks this, and she's been doing it for 50 years. Is it found in that King James Bible? No, it's not. Stop listening to her. Honor her, but stop listening. Mom, I'm listening to my Heavenly Father. But your dad, I'm listening to my Heavenly Father. You know what's trouble that I get you in? Have some lost family members <laughs> that are your brothers and sisters, and maybe your mom and dad, and tell them you're going to do what the Bible says. See how that goes over with you. It's rough, man. But your Heavenly Father, who saved your soul, said, stop listening to that instruction. Folks, there's a lot of stuff out there that's going to pull you away from that Bible. I'm not even talking about wickedness. I'm talking in our own circles. <laughs> stuff that appears religious and appears to be really sancti sanctified and everything, and it's right out of the pit of hell. Do you know the angel transforms into an angel of light? Uh, the devil, excuse me, transforms into an angel of light. He's not the prince of darkness. He doesn't come out with a red velvet cape lined with black. He comes with a Bible and a suit and says, I have something today you may have never heard of before, and let me open the scriptures to you. Look out. Cease, my son, to hear the instruction that caused the air. You have the words of knowledge right here. you got the King James Bible, the mind of God on paper. Watch out when somebody starts steering away from it. Yeah, you know, that's good, but I, you know what? The Koran has some good stuff in it, too. No, it doesn't. Well, no, no, it doesn't. I had a guy, I'll tell you this very quick because we're going to move on to the run. I had a guy on Friday night in downtown New Britain, and I knew, I just, right off the bat, just from doing it so, so many years, uh, it actually went well. Um, he goes, you know what Jesus' real name was, right? And I'm like, I felt like saying, your mother is his name. <laughs> but I didn't, because again, I'm growing, brother. <laughs> so he comes, and I saw him, he came home from the park, and he goes, his name's Yeshua. I said, God bless you. <laughs> he said, his name's Yeshua. And I said, well, actually, his name is Prince of Peace, Everlasting Father, the Mighty God, Wonderful Counselor. He goes, well, just diffuse it. But he's trying to pull me into that argument and cause me to get away from the words of knowledge I've been instructed in because he thinks, maybe I can just lure somebody in. No, I'm not even listening to him. The conversation, and when it went good, it lasted about a minute, minute and a half. I got things to do. I'm out here preaching. You want to talk about the Lord, about your soul? You want to talk about your sin and death? Then let's talk. If not, hey man, take care. His name was Jermaine. Talked for a little, two minutes, he left. Went over and played chess in the park. I'm not letting him pull me away from this book. Mm -hmm. I'm stopping listening to it. And you folks, well, you know, those Christians are me. You know what? Stop listening to it. It's not going to do you any good. Right. You say, well, that's pretty narrow-minded. Your book's a narrow book. Mm -hmm. Your Savior's a narrow Savior. Mm -hmm. Chapter 24, please. Chapter 24. Chapter 24. Same book. Proverbs 24. Please. Proverbs 24. I mean, he, he just keeps saying, my son, my son, my son, it's awesome. Verse 13 says, my son, <laughs> eat thou honey because it is good, and the honeycomb which is sweet to thy taste. So shall the knowledge of wisdom be unto thy soul. When thou hast found it, then there shall be a reward, and thy expectation shall not be cut off. 
Your Bible is honey in the honeycomb. Your Bible is milk, 1 Peter 2. It's meat, Hebrews 5. It's as apples of gold and pictures of silver, Proverbs 25. Your Bible is money. It's, it's wisdom. It's everything you need. That He's telling you, my son, my Bible can meet every expectation you have. It can supply every need you could ever have. You don't need to go looking elsewhere to fulfill your desires or wants or anything. My word can satisfy every bit of it if you'll just give me the chance to show you. And you that have read that Bible through and prayed some of the promises you prayed in hardship and in suffering and tough times, God's come through every time for that book. He will meet your needs. He will take care of everything. It has everything you need for this life, and think about it, for the life to come. That book's going to be there for all eternity. I would suggest reading that. I'm going to show you one thing. Go to, go to, go to Psalms. Go to Psalms chapter uh, 19. Psalm 19. Remember what he said in 20, uh, my son, eat thou honey because it's good in the honeycomb, which is sweet to thy taste. I think honey is the only food that doesn't go bad. Is that true? Does somebody know that? No, I don't. It's, it's like the only one I've ever heard that doesn't go, you have a book that'll never go bad. <laughs> it doesn't, it has no expiration date on it. I found some stuff in our fridge that's like 1999. Man. No, it's not my, it's, not, it's my fault. I'm taking a mic. 19. I'm just saying, things have expiration dates on them. Your Bible does not. Look at the Bible says in 19.10 with me. 19.10. Uh, actually, he says the law of the Lord, the the Lord. He says all those things, but look, at, look over what he says in verse number 10. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than the honey and the honeycomb. Didn't you just read that? Go over to Psalm 119. Go over to Psalm 119, please. Psalm 119. This Bible has everything you need. Folks, remember the old Swiss Army knives that had everything on them? They had, I mean, screwdriver, I mean, bottle, I mean, you know, uh, you know, something to clean your teeth with, man, when you get food. I mean, it had everything in it, man. And those scissors, they could cut through steel, man. I mean, you're like playing with them, like, oh, took off half your finger. Your Bible's a Swiss Army knife. Every situation, pick out a verse. Flip a chapter. Go a page. What do I need for sorrow? What do I need for happiness? What do I need for my job? What do I need for lost family? What do I need for a prayer request? Oh, let me go to this. Let me open that up in my Swiss Army knife. Oh, let me open that one up. Folks, my son, eat thou honey in the honeycomb. It'll take care of all your expectations. The problem is we get so caught up in the world that we think our expectations are something the world can offer us. And God says, no, son, everything you'll ever need is right in this book. But we're not satisfied with that because the flesh is never satisfied. Look at 119 verse 103. 119 103 says, How sweet are thy words unto my taste, yea, sweeter than honey to my mouth. You could keep on all those verses. The Lord, this book is so awesome. And he says, Son, spend some time with it. Son, read that Bible through. If I was to ask folks in this, and it wouldn't be a matter of embarrassment at, at all, there would be no, there's no guilt on it, but I would ask you how many of you have ever read that Bible through every single word? And how many of you read it through more than once? It's your honey. It's your milk. It's your meat. It's everything you need. And your father says, son, pick it up. Spend some time with it. Read it. Well, I'd like to know it like you do. Have you read it as much as I have? I'm not saying that because of me. It's strange to me. People argue with me about the Bible, and they haven't read it once. Right. Have you been ministering and preaching it for 30 years? Have you been trying to live it, trying to do something with it? Well, no, I saw something online. Then shut up because you haven't spent time with the honey and the honeycomb. When you do... It'll take away all those expectations you have you're trying to get fulfilled by the world. Proverbs 24. Proverbs 24, please. Proverbs 24. Again, I know you've read Proverbs through. I, but you, you don't really notice until 
maybe, like I said, the preacher pulls it out, but how direct this is when he speaks to you, the Heavenly Father, your Heavenly Father speaks to you, when he says, my son, look at chapter 24 with me. Look at verse 21. My son, fear thou the Lord and the King, and meddle not with them that are given to change, for their calamity shall rise suddenly, and who knoweth the ruin of them both? You ought to fear God and the authority he set up over you. And don't yoke up with unsettled people. Mm -hmm. You know how frustrating it is to be around people that don't know where they're going, what they're doing, and you get hooked up with them? What's worse is the first part of that verse where it says, fear the Lord and the King. I don't pay much attention to politics at all. I, I'm just serious. I know enough to be dangerous, and I can't even speak to it. I know there's Republicans, Democrats, there's the House, I know the House of Representatives, I know the three branches of government and all stuff. I know our president, I don't know if he knows who he is, but I know who our president is. <laughs> but, I, but I mean, you gotta understand something. God put him in office. Well, do no, no, no voting. No, God put him in office. I know that's hard to swallow, but God, that's why Christians shouldn't be involved in politics. You should be involved in getting people saved if you want things changed. Right. Get them saved then porno shops and now liquor stores are shut down. Get, them, get the owners saved. Get people safe so they don't start going back and doing those things. Okay. Oh, well, no, we want to vote. No, man. But Joe Biden's still president. Look at all the evil he's doing. Yeah, I've got enough problem with my own evil. Well, look at the laws they're saying. Yeah, i got a problem keeping the speed limit. You see, when your father talks to you as, your, as his son, you can weed out all the excuses and all the people around you, and you get to deal with your father one-on-one. -on -one. And he says, fear me, son, and fear the king, by the way. And don't hang around people that just can't make up their deal, their mind in life. They're unsettled. Last one, chapter 27. 27. 27, 11. My son, be wise and make my heart glad that I may answer him that reproacheth me. Make your heavenly father happy by not giving Satan any ammo to use against you or your father. You know what's so cool about the book of Job? That fight between the devil and the Lord and Job was started by God. God picked the fight. And you know what he said? There's nobody like Job on the face of the earth. One that fears God, eschews evil, prays for his kids, does sacrifice for them in case they do wickedly. Job's a good guy. In fact, he's one of three that Noah, Dan, and Job, that I, I think they're the only ones that could escape my judgment by their own righteousness. Ezekiel 14, 14. I love Job. But when you get into that, Job didn't curse, when everything went wrong, he didn't curse God. Or anything about, he didn't give the enemy any ammo to use. Do you understand there's an accuser of the brethren over in Revelation chapter 12? Do you understand there's an accuser up there that says, oh, you saved them? <laughs> Look what they're doing. <laughs> you, oh, oh, good job, God. Look at that one right there. That's a real reject down there. Listen, I know we all have some reject in us. But don't give that devil any more ammo than he has to use against you. And don't let him use it in front of your Heavenly Father. You can make God's heart glad by not giving that old snake something to talk about regarding you. Live a clean life the best you can. I know you're going to mess up. And when you mess up, fess up, and get back in fellowship with the Lord and pick yourself. A just man falls seven times but rises up again. Get back up. The devil likes nothing better than see somebody down and keep them down. Right. Get back up. Start walking for the Lord. Lord, I messed up. Yeah, I know you did, son. Let's take care of it. That's so great about our father. He's willing like the prodigal father. Come on back. Let's get that thing right. But don't give the devil any place. I'm going to give you one verse and I'm, uh, and I'm done. Go over to first. Go to 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy. What's the matter? No, I, I, as long as I've known you, it's never just one more. It's one more. One more. Shut up. That's like the Apostle Paul. Hey, man. 
<laughs> Consider what I say. <laughs> First Timothy. You know what? It's good to be known for something. <laughs> Why would I not give you the word of God? I'm just going to give you my philosophy. Let me sing. Let me sing a song or have a poem. Yeah. Yeah. yeah mm, that that would be that would be horrible. <laughs> All the only poems I know are not fit for the pulpit. So anyway. <laughs> First Timothy five. First Timothy five. First Timothy five. I'll show you something that pops up in, in a nice Pauline epistle, pastoral epistle. Look at the Bible says in five eleven. But the younger widows refuse. When they have begun to wax wanton, that's lascivious, just licentious behavior against Christ, they will marry, having damnation because they have cast off their first faith. And withal, they learn to be idle, wandering about from house to house, and not only idle, but tatless, that's how Scorby says it, also in busybody, speaking things which they ought not. I will, therefore, that the younger women marry, bear children, guide the house, Give none occasion to the adversary to speak reproachfully, for some are already turned aside after Satan. The enemy can speak reproachfully when a widow, who's not really a widow indeed, does what she just did. So don't tell me it's just the accuser of the brethren. You've got some Pauline epistle right there that if a widow who's not really a widow indeed, and she does what she's going to do there, and that behavior wax wanton against Christ... That gives the adversary ammo against you in front of your father. Folks, you're in a spiritual battle. I know you're eternally secure, but don't let that testimony go down the drain. Make your father happy by living a life that's godly and pure as you can. and Stay in fellowship with the Lord because you know what? He will use it against you. Your adversary the devil. Just a little couple things out of the book of Proverbs about my son. Hopefully the next time you read it through, you'll consider your father talking to you personally. Yeah. And some things just for you in your own life that you can tighten up. It's not religion, it's not legalism, but there's all things that we can tighten up in our lives. Thought life, prayer life, whatever. To be more like Jesus Christ and less like myself. Yeah. Brother John Savola, can you pray for us, please, this morning? Yes. Never, never perish, Lord. You'll always be with, with us here on earth and through eternity, Lord. Amen. And we thank you and praise you and love you for that, Father. We thank you for, especially for the cross, for our souls, for our sin was forgiven and washed away, Father, forever. And we thank you and praise you for all the glory and honor that we can give to you, Father, in our life. Amen.